A police chief in uh, Florida always had troubles in spring when thousands of college students would descend on his city for spring break. And the kids came to party, to drink, smoke, take drugs, do as many crazy things as possible in as short a time as possible. So every night, they were hauling in uh, kids that had done petty crimes or drunk. Most of them were guys, some were gals. And, uh, but it didn't really help. Because when they got out of the jail, it was like macho to their friends that they were in, hey, got thrown in jail last night. So he tried keeping them in two nights. Feeding them just bread and water. Or just water. But that didn't seem, seem to help either. Still was cool. So, in our country, we, uh, you know, the, the keep doing the same thing, banging your hands, get, head against the wall uh, method is, you know, pretty common. But this police chief was too smart for that. And so he tried doing the opposite. Instead of treating the students as adults, he started to treat them as children or babies. He fed them baby food in the jail. It wasn't so macho when you get out of jail when your friends know that you were eating baby food. So if you're having problems, try doing, and, and whatever you're trying is not working, try doing the opposite. Uh, a few decades ago when airlines were focused on service, doesn't seem like they are so much anymore. Ryanair started and they offered no frills, the cheapest fares possible. And today Ryanair is one of the strongest airlines in Europe and they carry more international pa uh, passengers than any other airlines in the world. So what do you do with people who cause you problems? Uh, you would actually call them your enemies. They're always on the other side of the issue from you. It seems to me, seems to you that they hate you. We live in a deeply divided country. As I see it, it seems like the sides are getting further apart. There's no dialogue. What do you do with people who disagree with you vehemently? It's time to try something different. Uh, Jesus shows us how. The verses we're going to look at of Jesus is Matthew chapter 5, if you'd like to turn in the Bible. These are some of Jesus' most famous words. They are the loftiest ideals in the Bible. These are some of Jesus' most admired words and deeply resented. Most frequently recited, but least practiced. In our text today... Uh, Jesus says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You think, are you kidding? You really want me to do that, Jesus? This is another one of the things I wish Jesus never said. So, so far in our series, we've seen uh, Jesus uh, says, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. You think, how can that be? But as we kind of dove into it, we found that it's only when we recognize that we're poor in spirit, that we need God, that we turn to Christ and we learn to depend on Him. And then He can work in us. Then He says, blessed are the persecuted. You think, what? How can persecuted people be blessed? But we saw that people that have been persecuted for their faith, who died for faith in Christ, or have lost limbs, lost families, been driven from their homes or their cities, are some of the most admired people and in, in inspiring people in the world, and they have inspired thousands of people to become Christians through the years. Uh, Jesus says, uh, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. It's easy for us who are followers of Christ to think that, you know, it seems like we're being marginalized today and less and less influence in our culture. But Jesus says you have the most influence of anybody in the world. And Jesus says you've heard you shouldn't murder, but I tell you if you're angry 
with your brother or call somebody a fool, you've already committed murder. Jesus said, so if you look at a woman lustfully, gouge out your eyes. You think, what? Jesus means that marriage is so important and sexual intimacy in marriage is so beautiful that you live as if you have no eyes to look at somebody else other than your partner. Now today, Jesus is going to show us how to deal with difficult people, how to deal with our enemies. We all have them. Someone who is just awful at work. Someone you can't stand at school. Someone who irritates you on your team. Someone that you're convinced hates you. Jesus says you can turn them around. You can make a breakthrough. You can change the culture. You can change the culture in your neighborhood. You can change the culture in your family. You can change the culture at your workplace, in your school. He offers us two words of advice, words we have never needed to hear more. The first word of advice is relinquish your rights. Now, this isn't popular in our day with civil rights, equal employment rights, property rights, privacy rights, gender rights, religious rights, First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights. Jesus says, if you want to change your culture, do not emphasize your rights. He offers four specific ways we should relinquish our rights. First, relinquish your rights to retaliation. Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, what Jesus does in his quotes, he's quoting either from the Old Testament or a distortion that the religious leaders had put uh, to the Old Testament command. Um, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth is actually an Old Testament quote, but the religious leaders were distorting it. Uh, verse 39, but I tell you, then he gives his comment. Do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, this would suggest, assuming the right hand is the dominant hand, that they're slapping you backhand, which is the lowest form of insult. So when he says turn the other cheek, now you, you've heard that phrase, now you know where it comes from. It comes from Jesus. Our culture is immersed with the right to revenge, the right to retaliation. Uh, but the Pharisees were misusing this eye for an eye quote. Uh, God gave it as a limit on the courts that they wouldn't over punish. Uh, but the Pharisees had transferred it to individual use, tit for tat, you know? So they used it as an excuse for the very thing it was instituted to abolish, retaliation. Jesus says, no, no, don't seek retaliation. Leave vengeance to God. Peter says, when they hurled their insults at him, talking about Jesus, he did not retaliate. We're talking about leading up to the cross and the cross. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Uh, Jesus' counsel is so different from what we hear in the world. August 4th, 2013 is a day Katie Lenz will never forget. That was the day she was hit by a drunk driver. It was such a bad accident that she had 15 broken bo uh, bones in her body and internal injuries. She was in the hospital for 800 days. Uh, the 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 accident became a national news because there was a priest that came and prayed with her and then he vanished. So journalists thought, well, maybe he's an angel. But then after a few days, they found the priest and he was reunited with Katie. And but the real story became Katie's process of learning to forgive. 
uh, on a Sports Spectrum podcast, she tells uh, Jason Roman how she came to forgive the driver of the other car. At the uh, uh, court, uh, in the court, the, uh, the driver asked forgiveness from her, said he was sorry, and she said, I forgive you. Um, and the judge put his sentence in her hands. You can either give him five years in jail or five years or, or, uh, or rehab, and he's going to do 500 hours of community service. And she chose rehab because she wanted him to get help. But she asked the judge to raise it to 800 hours uh, to equal the number of uh, days she was in uh, the hospital. She says it wasn't easy to forgive him. She said, I wanted to right away, but I couldn't. It was so hard. And, you know, as I lay there in the hospital all those days, I just was so angry. But eventually I was able to do it. She didn't seek retaliation, but she forgave. And that's what Jesus asks us to do. Second, he says, relinquish your rights to your possessions. Verse 40, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, you hear the phrase, take your shirt, is where it comes from. It means take you to the cleaners. Hand over your coat as well. well what this referred to is a person's inner garment. It would be like a t-shirt or a women's camisole. Uh, they weren't allowed to take a person's coat. Then the person, you know, might be the only coat they have and they'd be cold. Jesus says, if they take your shirt, give them your coat as well. Third thing he says is relinquish your rights to your time. Verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Uh, the Roman soldiers had a right to take any Jewish person and force them to go one mile, to, you know, take something for them or, you know, do something. And the, the Jews deeply resented uh, this. And Jesus says, if they force you to go one mile, don't be legalistic about it. Go further, voluntarily, freely help others. Reginald Andrews was deep in thought as he came to the subway in Newark City, the 14th Street uh, stop, and he was thinking about the interview he just had with J. McFoods, a food uh, distribution company, and a man walked by him, David Schneer, who had a cane, and he was looking for an open door, and he mistook the separation between two cars uh, to be the door, and he fell in and landed on the track. Well, Reginald jumped down there to help him, and he had a gash on his forehead from the tracks, and he pulled him off to a, a cubby hole away from the, the wheels. And the train started to go, and somebody yelled, and the conductor stopped, and, and they got them both out of there. Well, this is when uh, Ronald Reagan was president, and he read about it in the news, so he called uh, Andrews to congratulate him. He also called the president of J. McFoods to put in a, uh, a reference for, for this guy. And the, and the president said, you know what? I've already decided that we're going to hire him. So Reginald Andrews gave up his time, but he also was giving up possibly his life. Uh, Jesus' counsel to relinquish our, our right to our time is so counter to our culture where we are so time conscious. I mean, you slow somebody down on the road, you're liable, liable to get a horn and a, and a finger. Uh, we're apt to get angry at other people for wasting our time. And Jesus says, give up the right to your schedule. Fourth, he says, relinquish your right to your money. Verse 42, give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He says we're supposed to give our money to help those in need. Many of the fights we have today are caused by us feeling like our rights have been violated. And Jesus says give up your rights. Jesus says you can change your culture by relinquishing your rights. His second word of advice is love your neighbor Matthew 5, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now often, what Jesus 
is dealing with is the distortion of the Old Testament command. This was one of those. Uh, the Old Testament command doesn't just say love your neighbor. It says love your neighbor as yourself. That raises love to a, a higher level. We all know how to take care of ourselves. And then they added something that's not in the Old Testament. There's no place where God commands us to hate our enemies. They added that. Um, and the religious leaders would, would ask, you know, who's our neighbor? Uh, remember the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan? The, the man asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Uh, the religious leaders wanted to limit our neighbor to the people in our family, our friends, our people that are just like us. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Your neighbor is anybody who crosses your path. It includes your enemies. Verse 44, but I tell you, now Jesus gives his comment, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So who are our enemies? They are the people that we're convinced hate us. They're people that always come out on the other side of the issue from us. People that make life difficult for you. Uh, some of my enemies are not people that have hurt me, but people who have done something against Jory, my wife, or one of my kids. Jesus says we're to love them. He doesn't say we have to like them. doesn't say you have to go on vacation with them. He means you, love is more than a feeling. It's something you do, and you can be kind to them. Why? Verse 45. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. A children of your Father means a lot. Jesus says that when we commit our lives to Him, when we're born again, we become children of God automatically. But Jesus means way more than that. In uh, Jesus' day, to be the son of someone means you take on the characteristics of your father. And Jesus says, if you love your enemies, if you love like this, you will take on the nature of your father in heaven. If you love this way, you will experience transformation to such a degree that you will take on the nature of your father in heaven. I mean, this is big. It also means that you'll give proof to unbelievers that God is real. Maybe you're not a believer. But you say, if I saw a Christian love their enemies, I would be impressed. Uh, you express God to unbelievers. Uh, you will be proof to unbelievers that God really exists. I mean, this is a big statement the greatest miracle God gives to unbelievers is to convince them that He exists. He does that through creation. We look out at the, the trees and we see the you know, sunrise or sunset. We see Mount Hood. We see the lakes. And we say, wow, this couldn't have just happened. Oh, there must be a God. But not everybody connects with that. Not everybody draws that conclusion. Sometimes the way God convinces uh, people that he exists is through miracles. Many Muslims have come to Christ in our day due to God doing miracles in their midst, healings. But miracles of healings are not enough. After all the miracles Jesus did, after Jesus died on the cross, we read that there were only 120 people that gathered in the upper room. Only 120 devoted followers. The most amazing miracle that convinces people that God exists is when people see believers love their enemies and they are impressed. This is the greatest evidence that God is real. It's so unusual. It's so unnatural. When you love your enemies, it is powerful and you will be seen as children of your heavenly Father. Verse 45, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is the realm God lives in. He is good to people who are evil, people who want nothing to do with Him. Verse 46, if you love those who love you, 
what, re what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Uh, this kind of love is so unusual, it transcends natural affection for friends and families. Even tax collectors love their friends and family. They love people who love them. They love their kids. They love their family. They love their friends. That's not noteworthy. That does not draw attention to the reality that God exists. In the verses we've just looked at, Jesus says, if someone insults you, turn to them the other cheek. You're not to retaliate. If somebody insults you and you don't do anything, that's amazing. But Jesus says, there's something even more amazing than that. Take it to the next level. Don't just be silent and not do anything. Actually love them. This is where the power of God will transform your life in a remarkable way. This is the doorway to a supernatural lifestyle. If we actually love our enemies, it's the doorway to living with God's nature. When NASA sends a space shuttle into orbit, they have to get the shuttle into outer space. Um, beyond the gravitational pull that pulls everything down to Earth, uh, we all have this gravitational pull to be self-absorbed, uh, to be self-centered. Uh, by nature, our gravitational pull is to process everything in this world through the lens of how will this help me? If something helps us, we're for it. If it doesn't help us, we're against it. If it doesn't affect us, we don't care. Jesus says there's a miraculous way to pull out of this gravitational pull. For NASA to get a space shuttle in, out of orb, uh, into outer space, they attach booster rockets to it. So Damon, show us this uh, little video of once they get it into outer space, then the Booster Roberts, de uh, they detach. This was going to be you, Andy. This is when we were going to do it. Isn't that amazing how they detach and they come back down to earth? And there it goes. So Jesus says the nature of the Father is far beyond anything we can do on our own. And it's actually available to you. But there's no way to get free from that gravitational pull without booster rockets. The booster rockets, they can get us beyond the gravitational pull of being self-absorbed. They are in verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, if we ignore this verse, it actually minimizes our ability to experience God. He says that loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us leads us into the way of experiencing God at a whole new level. It leads us into God's love, which is bigger than our gravitational pull. You know, maybe there's someone that you, uh, of whom you say, you know, I can't even stand to be in the same room with them. Uh, he irritates me that much. She bothers me so much. Jesus says to change your attitude, see your enemies as an opportunity for transformation, to grow in the nature of your Father in heaven. Your enemy is your opportunity to grow out of self-centeredness into loving them the way God does. Jesus suggests two practical ways in verse 44 that we can love our neighbor. One is love your enemies. You don't just love those who love you. You love those who hurt you, those who make things difficult for you, those who always disagree with you, those that you say, you know, I, I think they hate me. In 1992, a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan made headlines. His name was Larry Trapp. 
For years, he had persecuted a Jewish man named Michael Weiser, and he was, all, he was threatening him, his life, and his synagogue. But then one day, he tore up his Nazi flags, got rid of his hate literature, and uh, he renounced the Ku Klux Klan. Why? Because he got a kidney disease, and he couldn't take care of himself, and Michael Weiser took him into his house and took care of him. Larry said, he was so good to me after all I'd done to him uh, that I couldn't help but love him back and leave my past behind. He loved his enemies. Two, Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. You pray for them. You say, God, let me see what you see in that person. Let me feel what you feel for that person. And then you listen to the Holy Spirit. You pray for their health. You pray for their families. You pray for their relationships. Uh, you pray for their finances. You pray for their relationship with God. Uh, praying for people always changes the way I feel about them. Uh, Viktor Frankl was in a, uh, a Nazi concentration camp. His wife died, his brother died, and his mom and dad died in the camps, but he survived. How did he survive? Well, he tells it about it in his uh, great book, Man's Search for Meaning. He says, you know, they took away my possessions. They took away my uh, name. He said, I just became a number. He was number 109,104. But he said, they couldn't take away my last human freedom. My last human freedom is the, the, the ability to choose how I respond to a situation. I can't control what other people do to me, but I can control how I respond to it. We can't control our circumstances, but we can control how we respond to them. So, we pray for Jesus to help us control how we respond to our enemies. Jesus ends this call to loving our neighbors and living in a supernatural lifestyle of love with these words, Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, these are some of the most discouraging and encouraging words in the Bible. Our call to be perfect uh, destines us to hopeless failure. We can't possibly be perfect. But then in failure, it forces us to depend on Christ. And this is the whole gospel. You say, Jesus, I can't do it. I am poor in spirit. I can't love my enemies. They've hurt me too much. Then he gives you his transforming power to live in you and to love through you. Jesus says you can change your culture. You can change the culture in your home. Maybe there's bickering going on, fighting. You can change the culture in your workplace. Maybe people are stabbing each other behind the back. You can change your culture in your school, on your team, in your neighborhood. Jesus says you can even change the culture in our nation. But you can never do it without Jesus. Ask him to fill you with his perfect love. Lord Jesus, thank you for these words. These are some of the best known words of yours in the world. And you ask us to do things that are very unnatural, that are very different from the, our natural reactions to people, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We think, what? Lord, help us to do that. Help us to discover your nature to love people, even your enemies, and experience that with you, a whole new supernatural level. I want you to pray now. Would you, your head bowed, would you maybe focus on an enemy? Someone you say, ah, this person's an enemy. Tell him you want to love your enemy and pray for him or her. 
and that you need his help to do it. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can invite him into your life right now and say, Jesus, I want to learn to love like that, and I need you inside of me. I believe you're the Son of God, and we're raised from the dead. Come into my life. Everybody pray. Uh, the things you tell us, Jesus, are so unusual. They're so different from our natural reaction. Uh, help us this week to take an enemy and begin to love that person and pray for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.